Please include your name, institution, and city information in your questions. At the end of the presentation, your questions will be asked to the lecturer and will be discussed. And now uh, I would like to introduce our guest. By the way, it's my privilege to present our lecturer, Professor Roger Sekaran. Uh, he is the chairman of the Department of Orthopedics, Trauma and Spine Surgery at Ganga Hospital in India, which is currently the largest orthopedic specialty hospital in South Asia. Uh, Asia. Uh, he chaired the AO Spine International Board from 2018 to 2020, he was past president of the Indian Orthopedic Association and many others. Dr. Raja Sekaran has uh, 307 publications in international journals, uh, 72 uh, national publications and uh, 486 international and 549 national presentations. Mm, Professor Raja Sekaran will talk about spinal tuberculosis. He is the top-rated expert in spinal TV in the world. Welcome again, Professor. Now you can start sharing your screen. Thank you very much, Selin, <laughs> and thank you very much for this uh, invitation. So it's really a big honor for me to be with all of you here today. So. When I received this uh, invitation, I was very pleasantly surprised. And I was very surprised to see this invitation also a video. And that was very nicely done. <clears throat> so thank you very much for this opportunity. Now, the greatest and the ongoing biggest prolonged war in the history is not between any two countries or two religions or anything. It is the war between the man and the germs. <clears throat> and in the germs, the longest warrior with man has been TB. Because TB is as old as man himself. And you can see here, what you see in the Egyptian mummy many centuries before, almost resembles the same that is seen in the Royal College of Surgeons Museum. And this is exactly what we are seeing even today. So nothing much has changed but there has been a lot of change in the concepts in the way we are, that we treat. <clears throat> For many centuries, the hands of the surgeons were tied because there was no way that you could operate successfully. And most of the surgeries ended up in a big disaster. And so all that, that was available for us was the sanatorium, sunshine, rest, nutrition, hope, and prayers. But overnight, that's why Carleton 1930 said, the surgeon who, as far as tuberculosis is concerned, swears to remove the evil from the very root, will only find one result awaiting him. That is the death of his patient. So surgeons were really scared to operate on TB spine. But what really changed the whole scenario was the advent of chemotherapy. And that we all know. The invention of all these drugs suddenly made tuberculosis controllable and there were dramatic cures over which we saw in our day-to-day -day practice and currently it is very well accepted that uncomplicated spinal tuberculosis is a medical disease because there is excellent cure and healing of the disease by chemotherapy with chemotherapy bone lesions healed very well without surgery. There was very good fusion, which you can obtain and patients returned back to excellent living conditions. And you can see the small child has a large retropharyngeal abscess. You can see here, patient did not have any respiratory problem. There is a bony lesion over here. So did not undergo even aspiration, was just put on chemotherapy. And you can see that there is a complete resolution of the abscess and very good healing of the bone, which is really spectacular. Because if you see here, now you can see here that a nine month follow up of the MRI, a large abscess over here, and there is a, this thing which has also healed very well. 
This would actually surprise many surgeons from the Western world. Now you can see here that there is a complete destruction of C4 vertebral body. There is a very large abscess in the front, but more bigger abscess in the epidural area, what you would consider as a dangerous amount of compression on the cord. But this patient also again was treated by conservative therapy. And you can see over here, there is an excellent resolution, no instability, restitution of the cord. And this is the range of movements of this patient. So all these are excellent examples to say that chemotherapy can give you very good results as radical surgery without the complications of major surgery. But there is a small caveat to this, and the caveat is it has to be an uncomplicated spinal tuberculosis. Now, this terminology, uncomplicated spinal tuberculosis, is often mentioned in literature. And what do you mean by uncomplicated spinal tuberculosis? Uncomplicated spinal tuberculosis means that there is no propensity for deformity, there is no gross instability, and there is no neurological deficit. Because when you treat patients with chemotherapy, you can find that there is an unfavorable natural history in about 15% of people. When you have more than two or three vertebral bodies involved, and especially when they are children, now, this patient has been completely cured of the disease by chemotherapy, but has ended up with a gross kyphosis, and this kyphosis is still increasing. And none of us would agree that this is a very good result. Now, deformity is something that has perplexed all of us, and that which is certainly a big problem for the patient. Because depending upon the severity, and also depending upon the site, you can find that patients often end up with paralysis or cardiopulmonary issues or stature and pain problems and loss of sagittal contours. Now, this is something that we need to visit. And that is the reason why very early, as early as in late 1990s, we reviewed all the patients which were treated by the MRC trials. 387 patients who had a 15-year follow-up and we found that while all of them were cured of the disease, 15% of patients treated conservatively ended up with a deformity of 60 degrees. But what was very interesting for us was that whenever somebody ended up with a lot of deformity over a long period of time, two things struck us. One is that most of them were the result of childhood spinal tuberculosis. And secondly, more importantly, what is not very often understood is that the increase in deformity actually occurred long after the disease was completely killed. Now, this is because you can see here. Now, in the adults, once it, the active phase is finished and the patient is healed of the disease, there is no longer any increase in deformity over here. But children, tend to have a higher level of collapse during the active process. But what is more interesting is that even after the healing of the disease, they tend to continue to increase in deformity long after the healing of the disease has achieved. Now, unfortunately, if we discharge the patient after the healing of the disease, we will miss this phase where the children continue to progress in deformity. A classic example is this patient. You can see that three years after the cure of the disease, this patient has been completely cured of the disease and has a deformity of 40 degrees, but was lost for follow-up and at the end of 15 years, comes back with a massive deformity of 115 degrees. Now, this is not because of the activity of the disease. There was no reactivation of the disease. But this is due to the growth modulation that occurs in children as they grow when they have a severe kyphotic deformity. And that is why you will find that many of these children, they are presenting like this, they get cured of the disease, but then progress like this over a period of time, and they end up with a very severe deformity where they get into many other complications. 
Now that might make you think, okay, if children are prone for deformity, the simplest thing to do would be that childhood spinal tuberculosis must have an indication for surgery. But when we looked at all the children in our group, we were pleasantly surprised that many of them actually improved in their deformity spontaneously, that this was not reported before. A good example is this. Now, this patient has got a tuberculosis of L2 and L3, and you can see that there is a fusion mass over here, two pedicles and a fusion mass. But after five years, when the patient is entering into the growth spurt, you can see that this fusion mass, which is triangular and small, actually starts growing up and there is an accelerated growth on the anterior aspect. And by 15 year follow up, you can see that the whole body has considerably grown that you tend to think that there is one single body except that there is a telltale sign of two pedicles attached to it. So some of these children spontaneously improved over a period of time by an accelerated growth. Another example is this patient. You can see that there is a collapse of T10 and T11 and there is a wedge shaped fusion mass kyphosis but over a period of time there is a spontaneous improvement of deformity from 41 degrees to 20 degrees because of accelerated growth in the anterior mass now this is something that you have to be very very cognizant because you are not sure that there can be a spontaneous increase in deformity now that brings us to the question of the learning point lesson Deformity changes due to growth was more significant during the healed phase of the disease than in the active phase of the disease in children. And childhood spinal tuberculosis is in fact two separate diseases. One that is during the active phase, it is acting as an infectious medical disease. And during the healed phase, it acts as a spinal deformity modulated by biomechanics. So when you are treating a child, it is very important that we never discharge a child with spinal tuberculosis after the healing of the disease, but they must be followed up through the entire period of skeletal growth to make sure that we don't miss this late increase in deformity. A question comes begging. Why do some children improve and why do some children deteriorate? And we again went back into our case series and looked at many things. But we found one of the most significant factors which differentiated these two groups. And this is what we reported in 2004 in JBJS, looking at the natural history of post tubercular kyphosis. Now, of these children, 39% deteriorated, 43% improved, and 17% showed no change. And the major difference between the 39% which deteriorated and the 43% which improved was one single factor, that in the children who deteriorated, we frequently found that their facet joints dislocated very early in the disease. Now, when we look at radiographs, or CT scan, or even MRI of these children. We concentrate a lot on looking at how much bodies are destroyed, what is the destruction to the anterior column. But we rarely look at the posterior column and notice that while the anterior column is collapsing in children, the facets are subluxing and actually dislocating. Now, in all these children in whom the facets dislocated, they increased in deformity. And that is why in the CORR in 2007, I reported that there are three types of progress in spinal tuberculosis. In the paradiscal type, where there is a very good contact over the entire vertebral body and the facets are intact. These are the children who improved in deformity. They had a spontaneous improvement in deformity. And in those in whom there is a single facet dislocation, there was a point contact and in whom there was one or two vertebral bodies which were destroyed and there was a complete collapse over here, these people 
underwent something called the buckling collapse. Here you can see that there is a single facet dislocation. So there is a point contact over here. And you can see that there is a complete attrition of growth over in this region. And there is an increase in deformity of around 13 degrees. Now, in some of these children, over a period of time, two facets dislocate, depending upon the destruction to the anterior column. Here you will find that there is a large amount of biomechanical instability because the anterior column is collapsed and it is not protected by the posterior column. So there is a huge amount of mechanical force coming over here. And in these patients, you will find that even normal vertebra, this is the normal vertebra unaffected by the disease over a period of time, because it is undergoing a lot of attrition. This vertebral body undergoes an attrition and you can see from 30 degrees, it progresses to 71 degrees. Now, why is this happening? It does because we know that the pediatric spine behaves the Euler's laws of slender columns. And when you have a destruction in the anterior column and posterior facets are destroyed, as soon as you reach 30 degrees of kyphosis, by the parallelogram of forces, these normal compressive forces of center of gravity, 80% of the vertical forces are converted to translational forces. So as a result, these vertebral body partially destroyed, they are pushed into the canal. And this is what we call the internal gibbous. And once they go out of line of this, now you have a strange situation where both columns of the spine are completely destroyed. And this is called in biomechanical terms, death of a column. And once this occurs, what happens is what is called the buckling collapse of the spine. Now, what is the difference between buckling collapse and uh, angular deformity? Now, when the posterior column is intact, you will find that these patients get either an angular kyphosis or a gibbous like this. But when the posterior column is also gone, and there is the death of the column. There is a precipitous collapse so that there is a deformity in excess of 100 to 110 degrees. And the entire spine above and below are converted to two major compensatory curves. Now you can see very frequently that this is what happens when there are two or three vertebral bodies which are destroyed, when the patient is young, and over a period of time, the entire thing completely collapses. Now this collapse may be either the superior column and the inferior column may lie on each other, or sometimes they completely slip over each other. And in that case, you get a particular peculiar situation where the kyphosis can be greater than 180 degrees because they are slipping over each other and they go. When they are falling on each other, you find that they have a bursitis over here and you have a very strange situation that, that many, many of them are horizontalized. You can see that rather than being vertical, they all are completely lying horizontal. And when you take a CT scan, you get an MRI or a CT scan, you get a very weird picture where two vertebral bodies on a sagittal cut you see the axial cuts of two vertebral bodies completely over here. Now, this factor of horizontalization has a very important bearing on the progress of the disease and also secondary neurological deficit. Now, there is a difference between the human vertebra and the quadruped's vertebra. Now, we know the human vertebra are broader than taller, whereas in the quadrupeds, the, these vertebra are much longer than broader and that is because there is no center of gravity force acting on the growth plates on these quadrupeds. The same thing happens when the human vertebra gets horizontalized and in these children you can find that these vertebra become quite long over here and they stretch the spinal cord over a period of time and this spinal cord which is actually exiting over in these are tethered when these column 
of the parabola increases because of the horizontalization and also because of the vertical horizontal growth of the vertebra they get into a neurological deficit this boy had a spinal tuberculosis when he was seven years old progressively collapsed and he gets a neurological deficit when he is about 16 years old and that is the basis of the secondary neurological deficit so what is the bedside value of our research and you will find that the facet dislocation is an important clinical event that indicates a point of no return after which compression becomes detrimental so the most important thing is that we have to look very carefully for the facetal status whenever we are looking at a growing spine and i also described now four important radiological signs which are very easy to find and these are actually on the radiographs a facet dislocation or there is a retropulsion of the involved fragments behind these two lines the third is a lateral translation which is formed by drawing a line on the pedicles and the fourth is actually that the superior normal vertebra actually completely topples over here now this is very important because if you look at it carefully all these four signs mean one and the same that means that the facet joint is dislocated you cannot get a lateral translation or a retropulsion or a toppling over unless the facets are dislocated and if the facets are dislocated it's very important that these patients have a stabilization so i termed these signs as spine at risk signs and if you can identify the spine at risk signs in small children like this it is very important that even though the disease is healed even though the kyphosis is very small that these patients must undergo a stabilization so that this kind will not happen now a good example is this child 47 degrees preoperatively completely healed of the disease by good chemotherapy but you can find that these two facets are dislocated over here and it is important that they undergo a posterior spinal fusion so that this child does not progress into a very bad disease. Now, the, something you learn a lot by learning from tuberculosis. And to press home the point that these spinal signs are very valuable, we found that it is not limited to post-TB kyphosis alone. It is actually applicable to all other pediatric spinal conditions. Now, this is a patient with congenital kyphosis. You can find that this patient had 33 degrees kyphosis, but suddenly progresses over two years to 104 degrees. And the reason, if you see very carefully, is because that over these two years, the facets have dislocated. Once the facets dislocate, there is a precipitous increase in kyphosis. And you also find that this subluxus and once the subluxation takes place, your neurological compromise becomes very high because the kyphosis then becomes suddenly angular and there is a pincer effect between the anterior and posterior column. This is another example, a congenital kyphosis with 28 degrees kyphosis, but you can see that these facets are dislocated. And within a few years, you will find that it has become 57 degrees and later, within three years, it has increased to an enormous of nearly 90 degrees. Now, this is the power of facetal joint dislocation. And you have to be very careful. Now, henceforth, whenever we look at a pediatric spine or a growing spine with a deformity, it's very important that we concentrate so much on the posterior column status as much as on the anterior column. And this is what I termed it as the functional loss or functional loss of integrity of the posterior column. Another case with kyphosis and achondroplasia. Again, you find that these children dislocate their facet joints very early. And that is one of the reasons why they suddenly increase in deformity. So this is very important. So the dictum learning is that no child with spinal tuberculosis 
should be discharged from care till the growth is completely over. And this is very important. So what, so what about that is about deformity and we'll come to correction of deformity later. But what about neurology? Now in neurology, we know that there is a lot of ifs and uh, questions and we know that the neurological involvement can either be very early in the disease at which time it is because of acute compression. It can be due to a cold abscess or caseous material, sequestrum of disc which are getting inside. But the most important cause, the most important cause for an acute neurology is the presence of instability. This is the most important thing. Very often we find that instability is overlooked. And if you stabilize the patients, and if you give them chemotherapy, the recovery can be very, very dramatic. Or the other end of the spectrum is where the patient has been quite normal for a many number of years. And over a period of year, then they develop acute uh, kyphosis, progressive increase, and they get a late onset disease. Now you can see that there has been a publication which looked into all the issues of late neuro onset neuro deficit and they found that it was cord compression and stenosis, distraction, non-union, pseudoarthrosis and progressive collapse. But in 30% of the patients, I just put this slide and quote this reference because this is very important to remember. In 30% of the patients, the neurological deficit is because of a compression, not at the apex of the deformity, but either superior or inferior, one or two levels by a disc prolapse or instability, ossification of the ligament of flavum or a stenosis. And this is something that we need to carefully look for, not just at the apex, but at a higher level too. And that is very important to know. However, unfortunately, there is no important randomized or large sample studies on this important subject because it is also it's very difficult to get uh, ethics approval for getting a randomized trial in this very important subject but the very few papers which are available on this all have mentioned all have agreed that in the current status if you have a significant deformity if it is a child and there is an extensive bony destruction and there is a neurological compromise, these children must be operated at the earliest possible. So this is another uh, paper which has proved that if you operate early on these patients and establish instable stability, they will do very well. So the general consensus is after 2004, patients are undergoing more instrumented surgeries especially circumferential fu fusions. And there is a general feeling that the improvement in paraplegia is better after the surgery part of it is well done. So if we do see a patient like this, one of the most important things that we would do is now only a posterior surgery, but we remove the entire compression on the cord and we also stabilize. So decompression, and stabilization is very important. So I was talking about the pathology on what is the natural course of the history of the disease and how the kyphosis increases and what we need to do. But what are the current status of surgery and what is the changes that we feel? There has been a lot of change in concepts in surgery too. Now, when we were residents, we were always taught that tuberculosis is an anterior disease and the surgical dictum is that anterior pathology must be approached and treated anteriorly. And that was the reason why the era of anterior spine surgery was started by Hodgson and Stock. And they developed the anterior approach from cervical spine to sacrum. And the modified Hong Kong surgery was the main surgery or the only surgery that was done for many, many decades, where we did a good thorough debridement by an anterior approach. And then we went up to the bleeding normal bone 
corrected the deformity and placed graphs over there so that it fused very well. Now there were two problems with this surgery. Number one, the cases which were operated in Hong Kong were all mild cases. And so when they debrided and put in graphs, it healed very well. But unfortunately, in the rest of the world, where there was very severe disease, when the same was done, there was not only a high mortality of 4% and major morbidity of 18%, but in many of these cases, these graphs were not able to withstand the demands of both biology and biomechanics. And in many cases, the graphs either slipped or broke or fell. And we know that whenever the graphs extended for more than two vertebra, this graph failure was as high as 85%. And the collapse that followed after the surgery was much more than what would have happened left by conservative treatment. So that led to the next step in our understanding that we should not only put in a graft, but also stabilize these grafts by using posterior instrumentation. And we are all very grateful to Oga et al. for proving that use of titanium implants in active spinal tuberculosis is very, very safe. The second big step in the surgical side or the concept was what was seen in this child. You can see that it is a six-year-old child. All the spinal twist signs are positive. And so she will undergo a posterior instrumentation, correction of deformity, and an anterior instrumentation with a fibular graft over there. And this became the standard treatment. Now, the, law, the posterior instrumentation was very important because uh, it took away the long periods of immobilization and it also prevented the progressive kyphosis and graft failure. So, posterior instrumentation after an anterior debridement became the dicta. The third concept was that if you are doing an anterior debridement, why not avoid the posterior surgery by actually reconstructing the anterior site solidly? And that led to the use of Jugendham's cage and anterior stabilization, avoiding the need for a posterior stabilization. Now, this also worked well, provided that you could get in a very snugly big graft or a cage and also anterior stabilized. But the issue was mortality and morbidity of anterior approach was a big challenge. Now, this is a real big challenge because many of these patients were very sick. 15% of them had associated pulmonary tuberculosis and you didn't want to actually open the thorax in a patient with pulmonary tuberculosis. If you look at this child, this child is already dyspneic at rest. And if you do a major thoracotomy procedure in this patient, it is very obvious that this child will spend a long time in ITU and also the morbidity and mortality in these patients will be very, very high. Like another patient here, you can see that he has got a bird's nest appearance of the chest. And to do a major thoracotomy in this patient would be disastrous. Now, that was the reason why when we clearly knew that anterior procedures had, one third of these patients underwent major complications. And the most common type of major complication was pulmonary. So there was the fourth important step of our concept of thinking. Is it possible to treat all these patients by posterior only surgery, avoiding an entire thoracotomy or anterior approach? Now the idea was to go posteriorly and then do an excision, a debridement from the posterior side. And then you closed from posterior and corrected the deformity. And this is what has been done over here. You can see that this patient has got a moderate disease, 51 degrees of uh, deformity, operated everything from posterior side. And you can see that this approach where you can get a very good access to the anterior column by excising a facet. When you excise one or two facets on one side, it just throws open the front of the spine through the back. And in the thoracic region, 
if necessary you can also sacrifice one of the nerve roots and then you have a excellent access to the front of the spine so that is why it came to be known that the front door of the spine is through actually the back you can actually do that very well and this is what has been done in these patients you can find that the deformity has been very well corrected and everything has been done from the posterior side another case of showing a massive disease again completely decompressed now this patient even had a neurological deficit so completely decompressed you have opened we have done a complete debridement of the anterior column through the posterior side and then you can see that one entire vertebral body has been gone at l1 now this has been very well recreated over here so most of these surgeries can be whatever you want to achieve debridement of the disease debridement up to healing lines bone decompression of the cord stabilization and reconstruction of the anterior column all can be now done by the posterior approach in the early 1990s and up to the early 2000s 95% of my surgery for spinal tuberculosis was anterior but now almost 99% of all surgeries whether it is active or whether it is healed or whether there is a deformity or there is no deformity the surgery is entirely posterior another example at a higher cervical thoracic junction again you can see that uh, completely uh, posterior surgery for an anterior disease has been done now when you do this you have to be cognizant of one fact of what is the difference between doing an osteotomy in other diseases and what you do in uh, uh, tuberculosis of the spine and this we have actually uh, alluded to uh, in this publication in the american jbjs where we proposed a new classification for kyphosis now the difference between other diseases for example you may do a osteotomy for ankylosing spondylitis or a schuermann's disease but you will find that there is no loss of anterior column or no loss of the posterior column over here so there is no chance of your uh, less chance of your spinal cord kink when you do an osteotomy but however <coughs> if you find and compare spinal tuberculosis you may actually take a small wedge over here but it actually corresponds to three vertebral bodies t11 t12 and l1 so you have three vertebral bodies built into one vertebral body here whereas the posterior column is completely intact so when you remove a wedge here to correct you need to be sure that you are doing a massive posterior decompression otherwise when you correct you will kink the cord and also shorten the cord and give rise to a lot of problems so this is what is shown over here so when you have multiple vertebral bodies gone if you actually extend and correct it from the anterior side you are actually stretching and lengthening the cord whereas it would be much better to do posteriorly but again when you are doing a massive deformity if you create a wedge and then you do a posterior closure osteotomy you are actually shortening the spinal cord so much that there is actually a shortening of the spinal cord or kinking of the spinal cord and that will give rise to a neurological deficit kawahara et al have already shown very clearly that what happens when you acutely shorten the cord beyond 3 cm beyond 2 cm when you actually shorten the cord you can find that the anterior spinal artery kinks and the patient gets into a neurological deficit so what is important is when you are doing a type 3 kyphosis according to our classification if you are doing a closure osteotomy you should not only close posteriorly but you should also adequately open anterior so that there is no kinking of the cord you should avoid this situation and do this so this is called the posterior closing and anterior opening osteotomy 
Now, whenever you do this, you may do it for moderate amount of kyphosis like this or a very severe kyphosis like this. We have to be very careful about positioning because these patients are... And once you do a standard posterior procedure, we do a costotransurfectomy approach on both sides. You decompress the cord sufficiently. And one of the biggest advantages of this procedure is all through your procedure, you have the entire cord in your uh, vision. Now, once you are done, that is the, uh, you can see using a lamina spreader, you can check that your osteotomy on the anterior side is completely uh, done, very well done. You can see that the superior spine and the inferior spinal column are completely mobile and you have gone through and through over here. So posteriorly, you have done a very good decompression at least one laminectomy above and one laminectomy below the anterior and you have created a very good uh, excision of the body and the triangular wedge over here. Now in acute kyphosis, you will find that there is a very dramatic appearance like this where the entire spinal cord is there. Then you need to create a big wedge over here and over a cantilevering effect, you have to slowly, slowly, slowly stretch the cord now, once you have created the uh, complete uh, wedge on the front side, you then use uh, adequate amount of, uh, you take out the grafts and then make sure that there is no kinking of the cord, either above or below, and then you can place a suitable cage into it and you can then uh, use the cage as a fulcrum and then you can shorten the arm by changing you can completely correct the deformity you can see intraoperatively a big deformity like this has been closed now there is a lot of discussion whether you should close and then put a cage or you will put a cage and then close when you uh, correct the deformity without a cage in the front sometimes you find that there is a lack of control when you actually close and that could be a translation of the spinal column. I always find it more convenient when I place an adequate sized cage in the front and use the cage as a lever arm, as a fulcrum on which you will uh, correct. Now that is uh, different. So this is <coughs> what we published in the European Spine Journal in 2010 on the efficacy and safety of this corrective uh, procedures. Now you can get very good uh, correction by uh, this procedure. You can see the clinical pictures of uh, pre and post and you can see that uh, one of my friends having published a very huge deformity but adequately stretched in the front and corrected and over a period very good reconstruction completely done. So the current concept is that the front door to the spine is actually through the back. I have not done an anterior surgery for TB spine for a very, very long time. Uh, having said that, I'm going to do one tomorrow through the anterior side because both L3 and L4 vertebra are completely gone. And uh, it's very difficult to put a very large size cage uh, because at the lumbar level, you cannot uh, sacrifice the nerve roots as you can do it at the thoracic uh, spine. But this is a rarity. Very, very rarely we do it anterior surgery now. So to conclude, so this is the thing that I would like to say. The lessons that we have learned is that childhood spinal tuberculosis is a completely different animal than adult spinal tuberculosis. Now, most of the patients who have severe deformity are the results of spinal tuberculosis in children. And what we have to know is that the increase in deformity actually happens at the time of the spinal growth spurt and not during the activity of the disease. So it's in fact two separate diseases. It's an acute phase disease, but after healing, it's a spinal deformity modulated by growth biomechanics. And we have to follow every child till the growth spurt is over. In the active phase of the disease, and in the late phase of the disease, healed phase of the disease, these simple four radiological signs, 
what is now known as uh, spinal trust science for spinal tuberculosis is very useful to identify children who should have a early surgery. And as I had shown by many examples before, these signs are not only useful in spinal tuberculosis, but also in any uh, pediatric spine group where uh, there is a progress in kyphosis. Spinal trust signs will allow avoiding this disaster and we have to carefully look at this and we know that this happens after the healing of the disease and 99 percent of the spinal tuberculosis nowadays is being done through the back so the front door of the spine is through the back so this disease was uh, described by sir percival pot a century ago but where are we we have now done a lot to conquer the disease in individual patients. We have a lot of success in individual cases. For example, here you can see that the odontoid is completely gone. And, uh, but you know, with navigation, even when the base of the odontoid is not there, you can have areas where we can actually put in screws and very logically you can fix. So individual case management is not a problem for us now. But we have to really understand more about the disease. We do not know why some people come with a small amount of destruction, but huge pain. And why some people come with three or four vertebral bodies completely destroyed, but there is no pain at all. Why some people have bone destruction, but no cold abscess, but why have some have very little disease, but huge abscesses. You can see that this patient had a very little bone disease, but you can see that huge psoas abscess, abscess leaking into the paraspinal area outside, large psoas abscesses, and why some people have so much over here. For all the advances in surgical techniques, we are still at the losing end in the battle against the disease. There is also a change in the spectrum of this uh, problem. While we were students and residents, there were equal number of spinal tuberculosis, TB of the hip and TB of the knee joint. But now TB of the hip and TB of the knee have become very rare, whereas spinal tuberculosis is actually on the increase in our country. We don't know why this is happening. It's all a change of the genetics of the bacteria or it's a change of genetics of the humans. We do not know, but there is a dramatic change over here. We need to do more work not actually on the surgical techniques, but we need to understand more about the multi-drug resistance and how do we conquer this and what do we do about when there is the double trouble of HIV and spinal tuberculosis. So I think we need to actually now no longer concentrate so much on the surgical aspects, but we have to concentrate on the microbiological aspects and also on the combination of the host germ immune complex and how we can modify so that we can conquer all this disease without the need for surgery. So thank you very much for this great honor. I mean, it was really very good. I was told I could uh, speak for a longer time, but I think any talk more than 45 minutes, it makes people yawn and go to sleep. So I will stop here now and I'll be very, very happy to uh, discuss any points which I have missed or anything that needs more elaboration. So thank you very much for your practice. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it was excellent presentation. Uh, it is a great opportunity for us to listen uh, to expert uh, surgeons experience like you. I'm sure it was a delighted Thursday evening for all participants. Perhaps the most dramatic uh, historic change in the treatment of spinal tuberculosis was the antimicrobial therapies. In successful therapy, the abscesses were shown to resort and the bony lesions filled in uh, with new bone. There is not complete consensus on the surgical indication for patient presenting with neurological deficit. Uh, much of the current debate centers on how to manage neurologic deficit in patients with spinal TB. Uh, this range uh, from recommending surgical management only for complete paraplegia 
to recommending uh, surgical management of all neurologic deficits. I want to ask your opinion as an expert, as a summary. When should we operate spinal TB patients with neurologic deficits? Yeah. So I have two answers for your one question. So what is theory? What is literature and what I actually do? So in practice, I am a strong believer that stability is required for neurological healing. I mean, that is a very, very important concept. If you carefully look at patients who are having a neurological deficit, you will always find that there is certain element of instability. Now, this is something that we don't really uh, look forward to. When a spine collapses in kyphosis, the capacity of kyphosis to compromise the cord is not as much as when the spinal cord translates. Now, even a very little bit of translation actually compromises the spinal canal much more than a gross kyphosis. And in this active inflammatory stage, when the spinal cord is swollen, when it is compromised, when the spinal cord can be sick, you only need a little bit of translation and instability for the patient to have a neurological deficit. So unless I am very pretty sure that there is no neuro instability, I would think that it is a surgeon's duty to decompress the cord, but not only decompress, but actually stabilize. And uh, we are now running a series where we have shown that if you do that, your rate of recovery and the extent of recovery is much faster than by not operating. Now, there are studies which have shown that even if you don't operate, the patient may have a partial recovery over a period of months. But, you know, how can you explain to any one of your patients, okay, I will operate, you may have a recovery much sooner, your pain will be much better, you may have a better recovery, but if I don't operate and you lie in bed for some time, you may have that much of recovery after eight months or nine months. So, in practice, if a patient comes to me with neurology, and if it is significant neurology, then I would not hesitate to operate because I feel that instability is a part of the problem and stabilization is very, very important. I would not operate only if there is a mild sensory deficit and I am 100% sure that there is no instability. Or I would not operate if the patient comes after many months after a complete neurological deficit. Otherwise, I would definitely open it. Thank you. And second question of mine, do you recommend early surgery or late surgery, such as after antibiotherapy in patients that we see tuberculosis, kyphosis signs? Yeah, so uh, I would, if you have decided on operating, why not earlier? I don't think there's any advantage of doing a delayed surgery. When we were residents, there was a lot of discussion on it is much safer to give anti-tuberculous drugs for about three weeks or four weeks and then operate because we were very worried that there will be any surgical complication or lack of wound healing or any other problem. But we know, know by experience that this is not true. I mean, you can operate on the patient immediately without a previous anti-tuberculous therapy. You get the same good results. And two days after your surgery, when the patient has started taking good uh, oral diet, you can start them on tuberculosis therapy. So we don't wait to have uh, uh, for anti tuberculosis drugs and then surgery. We straight away go and operate if we think that the patient requires surgery. Thank you. 
And now I want to share with you what our participants have written. Uh, Hasan Kamil Sucu uh, wrote, thank you for this uh, very interesting and enlightening lecture. You said the formation increasing is more likely in children. Is there, a, is a, is there an uh, age limit for this? Yeah. So all children have uh, uh, more slender spines and more flexible spine than the adults. But children below the age of 10, they are especially more susceptible for this for two reasons. One is their discs are much larger than adults. And if you calculate the Young's modulus of the spine, because for length for length, their discs are much larger. And the Young's modulus of the disc is much lower than that of the bone they have a very flexible spine and so they will very much collapse. The second reason is that children below the age of 10 years have still to the growth spurt to follow between 11 and 14 years. So when they have a kyphosis, then the center of gravity forces and the huter voltman law comes into force. And so during the growth spurt, their spine does not grow normally. So it further undergoes further increase in uh, kyphosis. So below the age of 10 years, it's a very sensitive period. You have to be very careful with this people. Thank you. And second question of Hasan Kiyami Suju. As I understand from the video, you only use a high speed drill, not a chisel by performing osteotomy. Are you breaking the lateral surfaces of the vertebral body as in eggshell operation? How do you remove the posterior part of the corpus? Yeah. So uh, we use a high speed drill preferentially because uh, whenever you are doing a massive deformity or a patient with partial neurological deficit, uh, if you use a uh, chisel, then there is so much of uh, movement of the spine and using a high speed drill is uh, very, very uh, safe and uh, softer and kinder to the spinal cord. However, you must be careful that you do not start burying from the posterior cortex. You must leave a thin shell of the posterior cortex till the very, very end. Leaving the posterior, a thin shell of the posterior cortex is very useful because it is automatically acting as a protective barrier to the cord and it prevents bleeding from the epidural surface. So you complete your osteotomy using a burr, leaving a thin shell of the posterior cortex and that you break by putting a L punch underneath the cord and then you tap it so this then posterior shell will break thank you, if you uh, have, if you have not removed the posterior cortex completely and then you correct the deformity then this will actually be one of the important reasons for a neurological deficit so you must remove the posterior cortex completely Thank you. Uh, Dr. Baran Tashkala uh, from Istanbul wrote that, thank you, Professor. It was excellent lecture. Uh, Professor Haluk Berg from Izmir. Uh, thank you, Raja, for this wonderful lecture. Uh, Dr. Ayhan Kanat, thank you for excellent presentation. You showed many complicated cases with spinal TV. What is prevalence of tuberculosis in your country according to European countries or USA? Oh, uh, uh, I don't know the exact difference in ratio, but I would say many hundred times the difference. So uh, an average spine surgeon would, uh, for example, in our hospital, we operate um, 3000 spine surgeries every year or a little more than 3,000, of which about 150 would be spinal tuberculosis. So we 
treat 150 cases by surgery and probably another 150 conservative. So it's good. And Fabrizio Rios uh, wrote that, Professor, one question, please. What is your experience about uh, chemotherapy? In Chemo patients, chemotherapy <laughs> in patients with neurological affection, if the surgery is not an option, uh, they can have a good outcome. Can they? Yeah. So as uh, I think I answered this question before itself, if the spine is stable, if there is no instability, if there is no gross deformity, then chemotherapy is a good option. They will have a recovery, but they have it very slowly. But if the patient has a gross deformity, a lot of pain, which indicates instability, then I think it's better to operate. So chemotherapy alone in the presence of neurological deficit is only present when there is no gross neurological, when there is no deformity and when there is no instability. Thank you. Dr. Murat Erman, thank you for excellent rich lecture. Professor Halikberg wrote a question. In uncomplicated TB cases, do you initiate chemotherapy before surgery? If yes, for how long? No, no. So if there is an indication for surgery, I would straight away go and do the surgery and then start the patient on chemotherapy. There is no need for Preoperative chemotherapy. Yes. Dr. Figan Kaptan, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Roger Sekaran, for your excellent lecture and sharing your experiences with us. I am an ID physician and uh, it, I had. It means the infectious disease. Infectious disease physician and. Uh, I had a chance to see from the surgeon's point of view, she wrote. Uh, Edilberto Flores, excellent conference, very useful. Where can I see the conference again? To Hasan Kamil I wrote the answer. Okay, uh, on YouTube. Uh, Dr. Yalnız Erol, uh, thank you for this excellent lecture. I see uh, as a last uh, thing, your answer, uh, Professor Kamil Suju, uh, from uh, Izmir uh, Online Neurosurgery YouTube site. You can see all the conferences. Um, as far as I can see, all question and comments are over. Thanks again, Professor Roger Sekaran. I give the turn to Kamil Suju for the closing speech. Uh, I want to hear. Uh, Professor Halikberg's opinions again. Uh, please, Atajan. Well, thank you, Kamil. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure to hear once again, uh, Dr. Sakaran, uh, which I have uh, discussed, heard his lectures, uh, I had the privilege to uh, know him uh, for years. And uh, I don't think that there is much to be said uh, over such an, a huge experience. And uh, what, and the reason that I asked that question, uh, there was once in our center uh, with the um, uncomplicated cases received the one month of uh, chemotherapy and then uh, uh, went for the anterior Hong Kong surgery. It, it was in 90s. And we, we left that uh, procedure uh, long ago. And I wondered if that was a uh, procedure in, in India uh, for, for a historical reason really. And the second thing that uh, lately I have prepared a TB talk for, uh, for some reason. 
And I realized that uh, we haven't seen a single case of TB uh, for the last uh, five years in our center. And I wondered that if what it was uh, only for our center or uh, for the rest of Turkey. So I have asked uh, all my uh, high volume uh, spine surgeons and the, the, the, the same answer came uh, to me that, that they do not see uh, TB cases uh, for a long time. And uh, so uh, it's surprisingly to hear that uh, you have an increased spine cases over the last decades. And, uh, and you don't know the reason. Uh, maybe there is no explanation for that. No, I look, I know the reason. Are you an because, OK, tell us. I know the reason because uh, TB spine cannot be eradicated by vaccination like polio. TB spine can be eradicated only by an improvement in nutrition, improvement in living standards, and improvement in preventing crowding. And why don't and you if, see the hip and knee in TB cases then? Something different, but I think it just means that you are becoming a very well developed country than India for sure. So congratulations. <laughs> well, the latest economic figures don't show that really. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor Halifak. Thank you, Kamil. Uh, as I wrote before, uh, there is a YouTube page of us, Ismail Online Neurosurgery. You can see all the conferences from the YouTube page and please subscribe to our YouTube website. Thank you very much. It was an excellent lecture. It was very interesting. Thank you again for accepting our offer to give a speech to us. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much, Rajan. Thank you, Halu. Thank you, Professor. Thank, thank, thank, you. thank you. Take care, Rajan. Take care. Oh. Uh, Greetings. I, I think there is one more thanks, Celine, from uh, Santa Cruz, Bolivia. That's interesting. Fabricio, Fabricio Rios. Rios. Thank you for the great lecture, Professor. You said. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you, Thank Camille. You. you have Good reached night. to Bolivia. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. İyi gece hocam. Hocam iyi geceler. Good evening.